um, and he is holding their youngest daughter, Anna, and on the far left is Michelle Ellis. Michelle's uh, currently on maternity leave, and so uh, we, we gathered together and we enjoyed each other's company, but um, that meant that we had intended to do a pulpit exchange today, um, but that got thwarted at some point, uh, so you're stuck with me. Uh, and uh, what that means is uh, I was uh, looking through the archives and uh, I dug up a sermon that I'd preached probably eight years ago. Um, and I, I dug it up because as I was talking with um, our men's group that meets on Thursday mornings, uh, we've been reading through, uh, we read a chapter from the Old Testament, a chapter from the New Testament uh, every time. We've actually made it all the way through the New Testament and we started over again. Um, and as we were reading through the New Testament in Matthew, we started talking about parables. And why does Jesus preach in parables? Well, we're going to look at what Mark has to say about parables and what Jesus says in there, and, uh, and, and this sermon speaks to that. And just as I did when I preached this uh, the first time, I want to give credit to, uh, to Duke Professor uh, Will Williman uh, for uh, some of the stuff that I draw from uh, in this. So I invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles to, to Mark chapter 4. Uh, Mark chapter 4. And before we read God's word, let's pray. Father God, you made us, and you love us, and you invite us into community with you. And Jesus, you rescued us, and you made us holy, and you enabled us to be in community. And Holy Spirit, you inspired these very words of Scripture, and you guide the words of of this message, and you are the one that transforms us. And so Triune God, we thank you for your word to us. We pray that it might deepen our faith, offer comfort to us, challenge us so that we may grow in our love for you and for each other. We pray in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, amen. So John, oh sorry, Mark chapter 4, beginning at uh, verse 1, Mark 4, beginning at verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but... When the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even a 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. And then ahead to, to verse 33. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. 
He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I think in some ways if you go down through the history of the Christian church, uh, part of that passage we just read from Mark 4 has been one of the more embarrassing and even outrageous passages in Scripture. Somebody put it out like, put it, uh, like this, that the problem, of course, is that we seem to have caught Jesus, of all people, with a very unchristlike saying. And, and what happened was this, right? Jesus had been teaching and, and ministering in that whole region of Galilee. And apparently he'd been attracting a, a great deal of attention. Because when the word gets out that he's about to preach a sermon by the Sea of Galilee, this enormous crowd gathers. And they are lined up along the crescent of the shoreline. And they're stacked up on the hillside, row after row after row. And there's so many people, in fact, that Jesus has to get out in a boat and and push away from the land in order to be seen and heard. Surely they grew still in anticipation when he opened his mouth to actually begin preaching. And, And what do you think they expected to hear? Well, probably not what they heard. Because Jesus begins in rather a homely fashion, right? Once upon a time, see, there was this farmer... And he went out to sow seed in his field. And Jesus is off and running with a sermon that that Mark tells us was just chock full of parables. And when the sermon was over, and when the big crowd had, had dissipated and gone home, the disciples and those others close to Jesus pulled him aside and they kind of sputtered, why'd you do that? Why did you preach to them in parables? I mean, what's all this about seed and, and soils and farmers and and baking bread and and beating around the the mustard bush, if you got something to tell them, why didn't you just tell them directly? To which Jesus responded, the reason I preach in parables is so that they will hear me and not understand what I'm talking about. Huh? So they'll they'll see me uh, but not perceive what I'm getting at. I don't want them to believe the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not exactly what I expected Jesus to say. I I expected him rather to say something like this. Well, the the reason I preach in parables is to make it interesting. You you know, um, a sermon, well, it can be deadly dull, and uh, you know, if it doesn't have some stories in it, and and so I, I spice it up with a little parabolic oregano. Or, the reason I preach in parables is to make it very clear and concrete, The kingdom of God is is kind of vague and abstract, a strange concept, and and so I I pin it down to what they know, right? Farms and soils and baking bread. But no, what we get is the reason I preach in parables is so they will hear me and not know what I'm talking about. I don't want them to believe the gospel. Now, if that bothers us at all, Maybe, I suppose, we can, be, we can be comforted by the fact that evidently it also bothered the author of the Gospel of Matthew as well. And, and maybe you already know and understand this, but, but Matthew is in large measure kind of taken from the Gospel of Mark. Matthew is, is built on the skeleton of Mark's Gospel, but, but when Matthew hits this passage, uh, when Matthew gets to this passage, he evidently can't quite stomach the notion of a Jesus who would intentionally obscure the gospel message. So he, he changes the story a little bit. J- just a little bit, just, a, just a, a phrase, but it is a significant phrase. In Matthew, Jesus does not say, the reason I preach in parables is in order that they not understand me. In Matthew, he says, the reason I preach in parables is because they don't understand me. Aha. Uh-huh. I kind of like that better. I don't know about you. right? In in Matthew, the parables aren't the cause of the understanding. They're a response to it. But but not in our passage, not in Mark. 
The reason I preach to you in parables is so they will hear me and not understand what I'm saying. I don't want them to believe in the gospel. Now, I'll be perfectly clear, right? If, if I had to choose today between, I mean, I, I'd choose Matthew, right? I, if I had to draw a line across the page there and, and put a check on one part of the page or the other, I'd kind of put a check on Matthew's section. I, I too, don't really like this idea of, of, of a Jesus who kind of intentionally pumps fog into the sanctuary. But before we, we jump into the lap of this kinder, gentler Matthew, Let's understand a little bit that Mark tells the story as he does in order to make a pretty significant theological point. Mark is, is trying to tell us a truth about Jesus and the kingdom. And, and I think it just may be a truth that we need to hear this morning. Mark wants us to know that it is possible to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ too early. Uh, that it's possible to to move towards Jesus too quickly. That it's possible to grasp the gospel with with too much haste. And and part of the reason Mark wants us to know that is that Mark is persuaded, maybe more than anybody else in the New Testament, that when people move towards Jesus too quickly, they misunderstand him. Right? Uh, That that when they reach out and grab the gospel in too much haste, they end up grabbing just the surface of it and and really missing the depth. And Mark does not want us splashing around in the shallow end of the pool thinking that somehow we're diving in the depths. There's uh, this wonderful story about uh, the great preacher of a previous generation, George Buttrick, and and, and he'd been speaking at this conference and he was flying home uh, to his church in New York City and and on the airplane, he had out his notepad, and he's furiously busy taking notes for uh, Sunday's sermon. And there was a man seated next to him. And he was eyeing what, uh, what Buttrick was doing with intense curiosity. And, and finally, the curiosity kind of got the better of him, and, and he said, you know, I hate to interrupt you, but, but you're really working hard on something. What in the world are you working on? Oh, said Buttrick, I- I'm a minister, and, and I'm working on my sermon for Sunday. Oh, yeah religion said the man you know i i don't like to get all caught up in the complexities of religion i i like to keep it simple do unto others what you would you would have them do unto you You the golden rule that's that's my religion i see said buttrick and and what do you do oh i'm an astronomer i teach at the university ah said buttrick astronomy i see yeah well i don't like to get all caught up in the complexities of astronomy said buttrick Twinkle, twinkle, little star, that's my astronomy. (laughs) The reason I preach in parables, said Jesus, is to drive them deeper. Now, one of the great definitions, I think, of a parable uh, comes from New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd. And he said, a parable is a metaphor or a simile drawn from everyday life, the meaning of which is sufficiently in doubt to tease the imagination into deeper thought. The meaning of which is sufficiently in doubt to tease the imagination into deeper thought. Which may be a very good thing because I think it might be said that the main heresy in the church in North America today isn't atheism per se, but superficiality, right? You can see it even if you look at the titles of most of the religious, uh, religious best-selling books. You can see it right in the easy way that churches are, are tempted to flee from worship or to you know, flee from personal devotions or um, not pursue deeper theology. You can see it all too often in television evangelists of a sort. In fact, a couple of years ago, one of them, who, whose name you'd know if I said it, was being interviewed uh, by uh, somebody from the BBC. And, and the BBC interviewer was very sharp, and she said, you preach a, a, a gospel of positive thinking, don't you? A, a gospel of success. Why, yes, I do, he said. I believe that Jesus helps you sail and not fail. The interviewer said, but, but didn't your own Lord die a painful and shameful death on the cross? I mean, how does that fit into this gospel of success? And without missing a beat, uh, the evangelist said, oh, like all successful men, Jesus had his setbacks. But on Easter, he put that all behind him. The reason 
I preach to them in parables is to drive them deeper. 